I created Beauty Academy, which is going to be our case study for today. So I'll talk about it later on. And I also uh, executive produced uh, The Bachelor, which is an American show um, created by Mike Fleiss. I bought the rights in 2004, and I did three seasons of the show in France. And maybe because they liked my style, the American uh, people from Warner Horizon and the American channel ABC uh, accepted that I would co-executive produce the season nine of The Bachelor for the USA. Uh, just out of a very simple idea, I proposed uh, ABC to bring The Bachelor in France and to do the, the season nine of The Bachelor in the French territory. It was called Bachelor in Paris, and it, was, it reached 12 million viewers on ABC at the time. It was in 2006. Uh, my show, Beauty Academy, is also now adapted in Brazil on Globo TV, Globo Souch, and it's called Desafio de Beleza. Now, what I'm going to talk to you about is, is about this. Um, just before I came on stage, some questions were asked about how do you finance a documentary? Well, my question when I came to China was how do I finance a show in China? My basic reasoning was I'm French, I don't speak Chinese, Nobody knows me in China. How can I do business in China? Well, I thought Chinese people are business people, so I should come more as a businessman and not only as a creative person. What kind of business are TV people interested in in China, like anywhere else in the world? It's to uh, get advertising money, to have good ratings, and to make a business out of the shows they put on the air. Um, so I, I developed a show, and uh, I basically sponsored the show with a very famous French uh, cosmetics retailer called Sephora. Uh, and this is exactly the story I'm going to tell you. It's the way I made my way to the Chinese market by having a sponsor that helped me finance my show so that when I came to the Chinese channels to talk to them, I was becoming more like a business partner potential for them rather than just a, an executive producer pitching a show. Because it's, it's good to pitch a show Stephen has helped us understand what's the pitching mechanism. Uh, but even if you have a great show, it's very hard sometimes to sell it. Yesterday, um, Rebecca Young was talking about The Voice. Well, The Voice took 18 months to sell to China. So it doesn't mean that if you have a very potential, very strong ratings potential show, it doesn't mean you're going to sell it uh, anywhere else in the world, especially in China. So you have to bring something more to the picture. And first of all, you have to bring cultural savviness. Uh, the makeup gap is something that I discovered through uh, learning and reading and studying a lot about China. And this is where all my project came from. Back in, uh, since 1949 to 1980, in the communist era in China, which is still communist, but at the time of the Mao era, um, basically, one of the good things about communism, in China at least, was that female and male were put on the same level, which meant that there was harmonization of looks, of, of, uh, of dressing, of fashion. Basically, people were dressed all the same. They had all the same, the same uh, haircuts. And basically, females were not using any makeup. Makeup was big in China before communism, especially in the court uh, in, in Beijing. But suddenly, everything uh, was leveled up, and this is how people, actually female, uh, fem feminine women, looked back in 1962. Now, in 2012, this is my friend Lu Yan. She's a very famous Chinese top model, and this is the way she's appearing in the magazines in China. Obviously, you see there is a very, very strong change in terms of beauty and looks, and uh, basically my show has tried to capitalize into this evolution of the Chinese society uh, when we're talking about beauty, and especially how makeup does bring something special to beauty, and how makeup takes a big part for any woman in the world, especially in China, to have a good life. Um, uh, so, um, this is basically how I worked my way through China. First of all, I created a format. Second of all, I found a sponsor, Sephora. The fact that Sephora is, is a French company and is owned by LVMH, the first luxury group in the world, obviously was a help to me because I'm French too, so I could culturally relate to these people. Then uh, I'll tell you about that a little bit later on. I worked with Dragon TV. Uh, I went hunting for a channel in China and I finally came to reach a deal with Dragon TV, which is part of SMG Group out of Shanghai. 
And this is my little boutique shop in Paris, A2G Creations, which is the company that I'm working out of in Paris, where I focus not on producing shows, but mainly on creative shows. Um, and out of the creations that I make, I go and pitch in France, around the world. And for this specific show, I could enter the Chinese market. Um, just a quick word on Sephora. So once again, th the show I'm going to, I'm talking to you about is, is uh, entering a category called branded entertainment. Branded entertainment is shows or, con or, or contents that are related to brands. Uh, this is a very big phenomenon, but it cannot happen in all the countries around the world. Actually, in France, it's very hard legally to embed products and brands within your show because it's legally forbidden. I don't know how it works here in Singapore. In China, the market is much more open to melting brands and shows, uh, all the more so as this melting helps finance the show and the show to actually exist. So Sephora uh, was um, uh, entering the Chinese market back in 2005. Now they have more than 100 stores and heading towards 150 stores. There is a Sephora store down the road, uh, actually in the building. Uh, and you, you can check it out if, if you guys don't know already. But it's a very interesting concept of high-end, luxurious supermarket of cosmetics. Um, so um, uh, it took me basically 12 months to enter the Chinese market. I think I was lucky because for some people it takes much longer. Some people never make it. I guess I was there at the right time, at the right moment, and then I met the right people. Uh, so basically I'm gonna take you through the process. Uh, first of all, uh, I created the format. It was back in 2010. Actually, the format was within me in the making for five years already. Now, when you create a format, it's not like, okay, I'm waking up in the morning and I'm going to create a TV show. It's more like, uh, like Steven said, so it's, it's working, everyday research, everyday inhaling. Uh, back in 2006, I did the French version of American's Next Top Model. And I had the opportunity to bring over the show as the godfather of the show. And you remember a guy called Karl Lagerfeld. Uh, Karl Lagerfeld is, is the number one designer in the world right now. He's the designer of Chanel. He has his own brand. And Karl introduced me to some of his friends. And behind the big designer that he is, I discovered that very talented makeup artists were hidden in the back, but playing a key role in making his defiles, his fashion shows, successful. So I always wanted to, uh, I started to think of um, makeup artists as talent, and I said, one day I will do a talent quest to look for the best makeup artist. The voice is a talent quest to look for the best voice. Well, I said, back in 2005, I want to do one day a show to look for the best makeup artist, because I think these people have incredible talents. Some are very bad, but some are very talented, and some are really artists. So I created the format formally uh, over two months in my studio, in my uh, studio in Paris. So it's a writing process. Then um, in September, through uh, uh, acquaintances that I had met in Shanghai, I had the opportunity to pitch to the CEO of Sephora in Shanghai, the CEO of Sephora China. It's a woman, her name is Anne-Véronique Bruel, and she was the new CEO of the company. So my, I think my uh, opportunity there was that she was trying at that very moment to have a bold strategy, a bold statement. When a CEO comes to a company, uh, usually they have 100 days or, or maximum a year to create their stamp. So I met that person at the moment she could create the stamp. And the stamp became my show, Beauty Academy. So I pitched the show to Sephora, CEO, and she said, this is what I need to improve, to increase my brand awareness in China. I mean, what best than TV to actually promote your brand? But usually brands sponsor a show or brands have a 30 second ads. Now, what best than a real show dedicated to my brand in China? Well, that's the best window I can ever dream of. So she said, I want to do the show. She said, how much? I answered the question and she said, okay, we're going to meet uh, the CEO of Sephora World in Paris. That was October. Then the CEO of Sephora World in Paris pitched it to Bernard Arnault's team. Bernard Arnault is the owner of LVMH. He's a French 
very talented businessman, very tough businessman, and they understood that for China, you have to be bold, so let's do a TV show. That's an original idea. So um, in um, November, I precisely budgeted the show. In December, we signed the contract. In January, I shot a pilot. Now, the pilot was partly funded by myself, partly by Sephora, so I invested also part of my own money into it. So it was more than a sizzle tape, it was actually a pilot, so I kind of didn't follow Steven's advice on this one, but I had some, uh, some um, financing from Sephora to help me do it. I also did a pilot because uh, I wanted to produce the show, I don't speak Chinese at first, I wanted to see how I would cope with the Chinese crew to do a Mandarin show, being a French person. And actually, I had a little thing here, like this one I have here, in my ear all the time, with direct translation of everything that was happening on the set for me to be translated into English. So I could understand what was going on. And uh, in the end, I do shows for 15 years. And uh, I mean, human beings are, whether they're Chinese American or Singaporean, are basically all, 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 not all the same, but they have some common traits. So I could really work efficiently, even though I didn't understand at the time Mandarin and I still don't understand it very well. Um, in February, I started to channel Hunt. So I went to Beijing, I went to Shanghai, I went to Hunan. I also went to Beijing to try and develop my network because in China, Guangxi is very important. Guangxi is relationships, as you all know. And uh, so I tried to have some backup, some, some, some premium people who would support my project and who also say uh, that I, I, they, I could be trusted as a producer and director. Uh, I, I channel hunted and in March, I met Dragon TV, which is uh, the entertainment, the big commercial channel of SMG Group in Shanghai. And um, the, the, the second opportunity for me was that they were launching uh, China Got Talent, which was a very big show. They had a great success and they wanted something new and fresh to put on the air after that show. They also, uh, also something happened is that I was stunned because I was doing this meeting in Shanghai in a hotel, the Four Seasons Hotel, and, um, and I showed my demo as director and producer to the Chinese crew of Dragon TV, and the guy said, we want you, we want you to direct the show, we want the show and want you to direct the show. And I was like, but I don't speak Chinese. How do you, I mean, are you sure of this? We don't care you don't speak Chinese. We like your style. We want you to be directing the show. Meaning that it was like being in the USA where people don't have any boxes. People can take risks and suddenly they give you your chance. So I was blessed that Dragon TV gave me the opportunity to actually direct my own creation. Um, we made the deal. Of course, we made a deal also because I came to the table with a sponsor and I came to the table with money. So we were discussing business, not only TV and content. And I think in China, it's, it's the, the, the name of the game. Like actually anywhere else in the world right now. Uh, I had to uh, deliver the show for the next summer, so I didn't have time to think. I had to set up a crew. I found a local uh, co-production partner in Shanghai. I heard the 120, I basically moved from Paris to Shanghai and I interviewed people day and night to try and set up a good production team. I hired 100 people that I needed to do the show, and then in May we went to do the regional casting. In June, we shot the show, and we edited the show in June, July, and August. And the show was broadcasted starting July, but just before that, I discovered that my show was not safe yet. It was financed, it was produced, it was green-lighted by the channel, but my show didn't have yet passed censorship. Uh, so, I, I mean, I heard about censorship, of course, but that was kind of a very thrilling moment for me to know that my show was going through censorship in uh, first Shanghai and then Beijing. The fact that I was being a French director in China, doing a Chinese show on Chinese TV, made the, the, con I mean the, 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 the situation even more tricky. Uh, but in the end, the show was approved and uh, broadcasted in 2011 on Dragon TV. Um, that's the promotional sp poster of season two. And by the way, you can see me on on the picture here. Why is that? It's because after season one, which was a great success, I'm going to give you the data right now, the channel not only wanted me to direct the show and produce the show, but they said, we want you to be on the jury 
because we think having a French man on the jury for a beauty show is good, appealing, and sexy. So here I am doing TV in China. I have a Weibo account. Yes, indeed. I have thousands of fans. Uh, and uh, it's pretty exciting. I actually have good friends at the airport when they see me coming, even though I'm flying economy, I'm in business class, and uh, so it's pretty cool. So um, I'll tell you a little bit more about that because, I mean, in the Q&A, if you want to know more about the way I do it, but basically I speak English in the show, what I say is translated, and I have a here, here, also everything is translated for me live, so I can relate, and more and more, as I spend uh, almost uh, half my year in, in China, I, I kind of grab more of the Chinese language now, at least some, some words here and there. And I'm, I'm having a Chinese teacher train me, but it's, it's a painful process. Um, so basically, Sephra invested in the show not for my, my eyes and, and for me, and not for anybody in particular. The show was made to increase the brand awareness of Sephra. Uh, that's, that was the goal. And the second goal was Sephra wants to position itself as an educative tool. Uh, Sephra wants to bring service to the Chinese female audience by explaining how to make up, to look better, to seduce a, a husband, to uh, work uh, better in the business environment, to look younger, which is very important in China, because I learned that a, fee, uh, a woman that is over 30 uh, and not married is, is called a leftover. That, that was stunning to me as a Frenchman. Uh, but it's the f Chinese cultural reality. So there is a lot of pressure on beauty for, for women in China. Uh, maybe it's the same thing in Singapore, I don't know. But uh, at least the idea was to try and help and educate the audience also about makeup. Um, I created the studio back in Paris with my designers, and we built a studio in Shanghai, which was related to cosmetics. Uh, I'll show you a, a little trailer later on. And the idea was to really embed Sephora's DNA within the show. So to make a fashionable show, to have a decor that would embed the values and, and the colors and the references to the Sephora brand. Of course, the show had to have a French touch because Sephora is French, and in China, being French is a positive statement, at least in the luxury business. Uh, I had to embed the Sephora products and the products that are exclusively distributed by Sephora. Uh, I had to position those show pretty much eye hand. We went to Paris to shoot two episodes to give it the French taste to the Chinese audience and also to appeal to people who don't care about makeup but who would be interested in discovering Paris in a new way. We had celebrities on board. I had Lu Yan, who is a top model. I had uh, Tony Lee, whose uh, Chinese name is Li Dongtian, uh, who's the number one makeup artist in China to be on the jury. Uh, we had some challenges um, in Shanghai, in Paris, in some Sephora stores, and basically also in every episode you have beauty tips and master classes where you learn more about makeup. Um, so, in a nutshell, the season one was, was pretty um, amazing in terms of, of return. Uh, once again, my goal was not to do an advertising that would last 45 minutes. My goal was to do an entertaining, entertaining show, servicing Sephora as my client, but also servicing Dragon TV as my other client. Uh, we were uh, Wednesday night, 10 p.m., prime time in China. Uh, first prime time is 9, second one is 10 p.m. Uh, the show increased the, the stock ratings by 30%. We had 25 million votes on internet to support the contestants. As you might know, in China, you cannot vote with the telephones. It was possible back in the days, five years ago, but uh, when Supergirl had 125 million people call to vote, I guess people got freaked out in Beijing. So they stopped voting through telephone, and now people can only vote through internet, which is a bad thing for business because you cannot make money out of the voting, but at least that gives you uh, an idea of, of the attractivity of the show. Uh, we had 15 million viewed on, views on, 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 uh, on the internet. I'm putting those numbers because actually it's very hard to know exactly what's the rating of your show in China, because channels can give you the numbers they want, depending on the business relationship you have and the moment uh, you are in the business negotiations with them. Uh, at least internet sometimes can give you a more accurate number, even though I have to say also internet in China can be scary because some, some numbers are played around. Uh, but on paper, at least, those numbers are real, and we had a 60,000 fan base 
from Weibo that we could see was pretty much interacting with us, so we could see real people were there watching the show and enjoying the show. The season two that is being on air right now uh, in uh, China, actually the finale of the show is this coming Sunday, uh, is, is going great so far. We have had seven episodes. Uh, the latest data I have is on the four first episodes with a 20% increase in market share with 5 million viewed episodes for the first four episodes. We have an uh, official partnership with Yoku.com and uh, the, the, the fan base now is 145,000 and uh, uh, basically we kind of took the show to another level. I have to say that also improved the show because I understand now better the Chinese culture, the Chinese viewers' expectancy. I did a lot of focus groups to understand my, my uh, audience, and in the end I think now I'm getting better and better at doing a Chinese show because I don't want to do a French show in China. I, I want to do a, a Chinese show with the French Dutch. Um, and by the way, my team is 95% Chinese. I'm the only foreigner. I have one camera operator who's German, but everybody's Chinese, and, and this is very enriching for me. Um, so to sum it up, um, before I show you some pictures and we can go and ask uh, and share questions, the show is now in the air on China for the second season. The good thing is that after the first season, I went to MIP in Cannes. I could pitch the show to a lot of... Um, international buyers, and I sold the show to Brazil. I'm very proud because uh, SMG is a very prominent buyer in China, and Globo is the number one Brazilian media group, and one of the biggest in the world, and Globo bought the show to put the show on the air on uh, Globo Souch, which is the satellite service of Globo, and on one channel that's called uh, GNT, and the show just finished now in Brazil. And I went to Brazil to consult on the production, and um, we're preparing already a second season. Uh, what I propose to you is to watch a three-minute trailer of, of the show, and then we can share uh, questions and answers. Welcome to Meili Xuan, the most popular Chinese Chinese show. 美丽学院第二季将为斯夫兰寻找中国超级美妆巨星，很棒的一个作品，谢谢你。那没必要啊，不要这个。上海的数千名选手中挑选出全国十强，最后的赢家将会成为斯夫兰新晋美妆巨星。最新一季《美丽学院》充满惊喜，我们全新搭建的摄影棚将供选手在比赛期间居住，并且全程记录他们的生活点滴。我们邀请到三位重量级的国际嘉宾担任《美丽学院》第二季的评委，《美丽学院》由斯夫兰赞助，国际团队倾力打造。我们拥有超凡实力的选手，并且他们会面对非同寻常的挑战。他们会来到竹林，打造一组与动物一起拍摄的时尚大片妆容。晚上，他们还将展现更具想象力的伪装造型。选手们将为享誉全球的音乐剧《猫》的演员化妆。选手还会到水族馆去完成他们从未接触过的人体彩绘。选手要在有限的时间里，使出看家本领，来完成一组奢华妆容的打造。选手还将变身为模特，来演绎 Michael Jackson、强尼·德普、卡尔大帝、玛丽莲·梦露的经典形象。他们还要为特别来宾的上海凤凰夜打造一组华丽妆容。请关注东方卫视，欢迎来到美丽学院。
欢迎来到美的世界。So, so that's the trailer. And by the way,、uh, I'm very happy to be here in Singapore, not only because I came first 20 years ago to be a trainee here, but also because Zing, the person you saw in the trailer, the makeup artist, is the number one makeup artist in Asia.、Uh, he's the makeup artist of Fei Wong. Fei Wong is the Celine Dion and Michael Jackson together of of China and Asia. And Zing is born in Singapore. Uh, Zing is a fantastic artist, a great person. He was born and raised here. He left Singapore when he was 18 to go to take his chances in Hong Kong, and he became the number one makeup artist from Hong Kong, and took care of all the big up-and-coming stars from the movies and the music. And now he's he's almost a star in his own sake. He has two million followers on Weibo, and Zing is is just a, an incredible artist. So、uh, I'm very glad that I have a Singaporean-born、uh, partner in the show in China, uh, and uh, uh, that's a tribute to, China, to, to Singapore、uh, also. So now,、uh, guys, I mean, if you have any any questions to ask me about、uh, my Chinese adventure or the show, or if you're interested to do the show in Singapore or any other country in Southeast Asia, I would love to answer to your questions. Yes. Did Sephora then create a special line of products in their stores, where they took the Beauty Academy name and integrated it on the products, did consumer promotions, and all the other things that brands tend to do with branded entertainment these days? And how successful were any of those campaigns in terms of ROI? Well, that that was the one of the question we had was, do we immediately create some ancillary products to go with the show, like the Beauty Academy case of products,、uh, etc. and etc.?、Uh, we're we're pre- Sephora is preparing that for the for the next season if we actually do the next season. But at first, the idea was not to. First, the idea was to create brand awareness, so we were focusing on the Sephora brand.、Uh, number two, Sephora、uh, to help gather. Financing for the show has some of its exclusive brand partners, like Makeup Forever, like Benefit, like Herbarist, to、uh, participate in the show. So in the end, it was not decided by Sephora to do a Beauty Academy special toolkit, but more to do some special focuses on those brands, depending on the episodes being on the air. For example,、uh, uh, Sephora asked me to to work with.、Um, Makeup Forever, and it happens that this very famous makeup brand created a lipstick that is called Moulin Rouge lipstick. So what I did was design a whole episode around the Moulin Rouge. We went to Paris to shoot、uh, the contestants, the makeup artists, where they were trained by the dancers of Moulin Rouge on how to do makeup. Fast stage makeup. It happens that the dancer at Moulin Rouge do the makeup on themselves or by themselves. So it was very interesting because they trained the makeup artists, male and female. Then they had to do the makeup on themselves to be ready to go on stage. And the best two of that group was selected to do the real makeup before the dancers were going on stage at Moulin Rouge. So the whole episode was around Makeup Forever's Moulin Rouge. But in a way that for the audience it would be entertaining, and for 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 the viewer it would also it would not be like pure brand positioning and product placement. It would be storytelling, servicing the brand,、uh, and not the brand being a, a pain in the ass. So to answer your question,、uh, there was no specific product creation out of the show yet. But there were some specific marketing campaigns dedicated to the products that were put in light within each episode. Yes, I hope、uh, my answer is clear to you. Hi, you said you lived and breathed the creation of your format for four or five months to develop it, but it sounds like the sponsor took over and led you by the nose and told you what to make. So, how much of it is truly your format versus how much the sponsor ends up influencing the production? Okay,、uh, first of all, it's not for five months; it's for five years.、Uh, so it means it was really within me. And to answer your question, well, I'm very lucky, producer.、Uh, first of all, I have to say I don't come from the advertising business. 
I come from the TV business. I've been doing shows for 15 years. So my main concern is ratings. It's not brands. Uh, so when I pitched the show to Sephora, CEO, I told them the first thing that I wanted to be clear between us is that I will never put the brand or any products in the show unless it makes sense for the viewer in the storytelling of the show. So no, they didn't take over the show at all. Uh, what I did as a producer, though, was servicing them by uh, embedding Sephora within the show. Uh, for example, I have a slide back there where you see the studio. In the studio, I told Sephora, I don't want any Sephora logo. Well, in China, you have logos of sponsors everywhere. Everywhere in the background of the juries, not only on the TV side, but also in the decor. Now, Sephora said, I understand you want the logo, but please give me something that will relate to my brand. So I went to the stores, I studied the stores, and within the decor, you have some black and white references that are there. So basically, people understand this is a Sephora show, but they don't see the brand. So, well, maybe actually the brand took me over, or maybe I wanted to service them well enough so that I took what they have as DNA, and I embed it in the show, but with always being careful not to push the brand in the face of the viewer, because viewers are educated. If it's too commercial, they're going to zap and go to another show. So my balance was to try and make Sephora happy while making a real entertainment show. And to finish answering your question, I don't like the term branded content, because first of all, content, what is content? My job is to do programs. I don't do content, I do programs. And so I, I try to do a branded programming I mean, experience. I, I like to call the, this show a branded entertainment experience. Uh, so, of course, Sephora is paying for a big chunk of the show. So I have to, um, of course, uh, respect that and service them. But I had a management uh, in front of me that was bright enough to understand that if the brand is too too obvious within the show on the products all over the place, the show won't have good ratings, so we won't reach the ultimate goal. And so they, they let me a lot of room to, you know, create stories rather than product placement. Yes? A couple of questions here. Um, what did uh, Dragon TV bring to the table? Was it purely in kind or was there a monetary, uh, did they put in any monetary contribution to the show? Uh, and secondly, uh, do you own all the rights to the format? And, and does Sephora or does uh, Dragon TV own any rights? And how did you then subsequently uh, sort of sell this format to, to Brazil, for example, okay. or to others? Okay, for, to, to answer the first uh, question, no, DTV didn't bring any cash to the table, but DTV brings some, uh, uh, a lot of different elements. First of all, they bring the air, of course, to have a show like that on the air uh, is, is part of the deal. It's a 52-minute show, we had 10 prime time, we had a big press conference in Shanghai, a lot of media coverage, so the fact that they opened the channel and what gave us, and they sold us one hour, basically. Uh, Steel was not natural to them, uh, and so, uh, they, so they brought some airtime. They brought some promotional time. We negotiated a package of, of promos on the air to go with the show, uh, each promo being sponsored by Sephora. So we kind of developed a, a net of on-air promotion plan that would fit Sephora's needs and would fit DTV's needs. Being a former TV executive for 10 years helped me also uh, design that with Sephora and to propose it to DTV. Um, and, and last but not least, we have had very proactive conversations with uh, people at DTV. Uh, my, my direct counterpart uh, is the head of production at uh, Dragon TV. His name is Mr. Dai. And Mr. Dai is a very experienced producer. And so it was, we had a lot of exchange so that the show would be Chinese show with a French touch. Uh, that's one thing. And the second thing is, I'm doing shows for 15 years, and China is, 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 is getting to be an, on par with all the other international markets. But there are things you cannot do in China that you can do in France or the US. And they help me understand that better. For example, uh, my way of editing a show is very American-like, so it goes very fast, a lot of teasers, a lot of ways to catch the audience and to, to keep them. Uh, in China, you have to take time to explain things. You have to make sure people understand the rules, otherwise they think it's, they don't get it. Uh, I, have to, I have had to calm down my editing uh, techniques, or at least style, 
with my editors uh, to make sure everybody understood. Uh, while I was used to going very fast because in Europe, people are eating this kind of writing. So basically, DTV brought a lot of their expertise to us doing the proper show. And last but not least, I think the fact that DTV said, we want to do the show, of course they, made, they, they, are, they have their financial interest to do the show, but they took the show to Beijing for the censorship. They went to see Soft to defend the show and to have authorization for the show to be on air. Well, that's a very big uh, plus that they brought to the picture. So overall, uh, uh, we're very happy of, of the way we've worked with them. And the second season now is on the air, and hopefully we'll do a third one. Okay, second part of your question. I am, uh, so I own, the four, I, I own basically all the rights of the show. Uh, uh, maybe because I'm a 15 year uh, exper experienced uh, TV executive, and that, um, as Stephen was saying just before, it depends on your lawyer. Well, as far as I'm concerned, it depends also on my expertise and, and what I bring to the table. So basically, I, I, I created the show in France, so it's protected under French laws which are, by the way, the best laws in the world for copyright protection and intellectual property protection. So I'm happy to be French in that respect. Um, for example, in the US, the, 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 the intellectual protection doesn't exist. It's the copyright protection, which is different. Uh, so I'm recognized as an author. I own the, 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 the legal rights of the show, so I could bring it to China. Now, it doesn't mean my show is not going to be copied. Of course not, because copy is everywhere. But then the execution of the show is the one that protects you most. And I have my unique way of doing it. And that's why also I think the TV hired me. So I hope at least the style of the show makes it different from any other copycat that might exist. Um, as far as the finished product, I also own the rights of the, the copyrights of the masters. And uh, that helped me to uh, actually not only sell the rights of the show to Brazil, but also uh, I'm trying to get second windows for the show in Asia for Chinese-speaking markets. Uh, and of course, uh, Sephora will be interested in those sales. Uh, they're not interested in owning a show. This is not their business. A and it was not my idea at first at all. But we, uh, uh, Sephora has a first look option to be the sponsor of the show in any country we do it in the world. And Sephora has uh, ancillary revenues interest in everything we do, uh, including reselling the, the, the Chinese show anywhere else. How do you engage the audience? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, makeup is, is quite niche and not at all niche, because every woman makeup in the morning, at least uh, in China, makeup is very big. Uh, so being a makeup artist is very niche. Uh, but talking about makeup and learning about beauty tips is pretty wide in audience appeal. Um, I'm still struggling with that question, though. I have to say, um, the show is, is, is not the voice in China. It's a show that does very well, but it's not the national phenomenon because I think makeup artists are still a niche community. But at least what I'm trying to do, uh, uh, and better in the second season, hopefully in the third season, is to get the female audience to be interested in the show, not because they want to become makeup artists, but because they want to use the skills of the makeup artists for themselves. Uh, so I tend to, for example, uh, each episode has some challenges, and each challenge has some themes, and I tend to develop themes around seduction. Uh, a very big phenomenon in China is, is, is getting married, like anywhere else in the world, it's, it's dating, and but still, there is a lot of issues around that. So how do you make up for a date? Uh, uh, how are you going to be sexy enough, but not too sexy? What do you want to say through makeup? Uh, second thing is, for example, how do you want to do makeup when you go to work? Uh, for a job interview, uh, for a business negotiation, for a gala party? Well, all these things Chinese people are very much in need of learning how to do. Maybe not in Shanghai or Beijing, because people are very well already uh, occidentalized and educated. Uh, but in second-tier cities, third-tier cities in real China, this information is, is, is uh, uh, a need for people. And actually, the show is doing very good in some uh, second-tier cities around in, in Liaoning, in, in uh, Chongqing, um, in Kunming, meaning that um, uh, uh, there is 600 million potential viewers, 600 million women in China that can watch the show. So hopefully, the show will be more and more appealing to a wide audience. 
Thank you, Alexis. Well, thank you, guys, too. Thank you for listening. Yes. Thank you.